Okay, good morning everybody and we welcome to uh, Thursday's Blue Talks here at North Shipping 2019. Yesterday we had a number of sessions where we focused heavily on sustainability and um, issues such as vessel operations, hull fouling, and all the way through yesterday and even on Tuesday when I was interviewing some of the uh, um, key people involved in the oceans, the story of data kept on arising and I've begun to realize that when we talk about data, that everybody's got a different definition almost of data, different types of data, different things that data can be used to do. Our first three sessions today are going to be focused on um, data, and it is with pleasure, actually, that we uh, have our first session within Marsat, looking at how IoT is going to evolve within this industry. They've been doing a lot of work lately, and they've had a number of reports published on IoT. And this is one of the big next steps. I think everybody has seen how data has started to be used and how connectivity has started to improve. And now we have IoT. and. After we have the, uh, the session from Diego um, about Inmarsat's work in that area, we're going to have a panel session where I'm going to look at how some of these companies that are emerging, developing solutions in IoT and other data services, are actually connecting with some of the big players to form what would be the sort of the next network of um, industry players within the shipping and maritime sectors. So it is with great pleasure now that I invite Diego to come up to the stage and give his presentation from Inmarsat. Thank you. There is a pointer. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, it looks like my presentation. Well, I see there are quite a few of you. It's uh, very nice to be here. Uh, normally, in the maritime environment, I find a very friendly audience, and uh, you guys look friendly as well. Therefore, I'm comfortable. I'll try to keep it short in order to have two, three minutes for Q&A. Uh, so we can go deeper into what, what you're really interested in. You're familiar with this situation. Uh, I was at a meeting in, in Geneva, it was almost a month ago, and uh, we had uh, ship owners really complaining about their industry, really complaining about the dynamics and what's been happening in the last uh, 10 to 12 years. And, uh, all topics you know, the overcapacity, now almost having to pay to scrap your, your own ship. The shorter life cycle, ships get an obsolete much quicker uh, than in the past. Uh, falling prices, trade war having a significant impact on uh, how we exchange uh, products throughout the world. And regulations. So, it all looks like uh, downsides. It all looks like downward pressure. And uh, they were really complaining. I mean, they, they look uh, really disappointed with, with their businesses and not really understanding what was the way forward. And uh, I had a, just a short intervention and I said, well, are you looking at your efficiencies? Are you looking at how you manage your assets, how you manage your business? And uh, how you can gain uh, uh, obtain profit out of improving your operations. And uh, they didn't look like they were very familiar with the, with the topic. And that made me feel that at Inmarsat we are working on the right topics. Now data, we talk about data, uh, lots of data. Uh, you can read the slide, where the data is coming from, what's, what's the amount of data. Now, uh, I'm not sure many people understand what is the potential of the data and how you can monetize from data. This is a situation from Maersk. Uh, we always take Maersk as an example as the biggest account probably in the world. And uh, understanding the huge amounts of data that they need to transfer from their ships to shore in order to manage their own data. Without looking at the, the, the huge players like Marsk, we know that this is a pretty fragmented industry, we have a look at what we estimate, and this is an interesting report uh, that you can download from our website, how much ship owners are estimated to spend on IoT solutions uh, in the coming three years. It's 2.5 million, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money, especially if you don't really know 
what you're going to do with your IoT infrastructure slash data. So all the ship owners are looking at thinking of data as an enabler to monitor your fuel, monitor your environmental impact. But the biggest obstacle is real time. I mean, you really have to intervene on your performance real time in order to achieve uh, significant improvements. Otherwise, you get to harbor, you dump your data, and then you found, find out hours or weeks later what you could have done differently. So this is shaping up very nicely for Inmarsat. So again, the challenge is how we manage to collect and transfer data from our ship into the shore. How do we manage to scale it up throughout our entire fleet without having to uh, uh, run into significant investments? So Inmarsat Solution, which, which we are typically a satellite connectivity uh, company, but we are called from our customers uh, to expand our solutions, expand our services, and to facilitate data access, facilitate data transfer. Therefore, we've been expanding and extending uh, our expertise and competitive advantage on pure data. And therefore, Fleet Data is our proposed solution, which is a very simple infrastructure to harvest data from whatever on the ship and through our satellite connectivity, put it on a cloud. And from that cloud, give the customer access to their own data through their own analytics service providers and manage their data at a flat fee. OK? So again, uh, dedicated bandwidth. Therefore, that means that fleet data does not interfere with the bandwidth that you need in order to operate your ship and your satellite uh, communications. It is an agnostic platform. Therefore, we can manage almost any kind of uh, protocols on board. The typical data that, we are, mm, that customers are interested in is VDR data. Therefore, we source data, we harvest data before it's ingested on the VDR. And that's something fantastic because that gives to the ship owner or whoever the ship owner wants to almost real-time visibility on what's going on on the vessel. Therefore, be able to store your data on a cloud and be able then to appoint your trusted um, analytic service providers. So just a very quick and graphic visual representation of what we do, where we, we source the data from and how the data flow easily goes from your ship into into your facilities. Again, uh, through, through rainmaking, uh, we, 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 we used it as a, as a good vehicle to expand our cooperation, collaboration with different companies. And uh, we, we were discussing and working with Scanridge in order to further increase our data harvesting capabilities through local wireless network solutions. And again, this is extending the, the, the value proposition to our customers. That means being able to harvest data from anyone, anywhere on the ship without having to cable your ship, which, as you know, is a, is a significant constraint. Therefore, from the sensor to the bridge to the cloud to your desk on an analytics report. Just uh, again to, to thank uh, Scanridge for having facilitated our access to, to North Sea Giant, where we are currently uh, running a trial in cooperation with uh, North Sea Giant and, uh, and uh, Scanridge uh, to prove our technology, to prove the value uh, of uh, what we're doing for ship owners. And then this is the commercial part. Uh, basically, we are running a campaign until September 
where we are offering 300 installations free of charge for a period of uh, three months. If you just sign up for fleet data, extend it for additional three months in case you sign up for uh, uh, analytic services through the API uh, access. Therefore, if you're interested, we are on Hall B. You can contact me or any of our colleagues, and we can give you further details on uh, what fleet data is about, what the benefit is, uh, and uh, what is required in order to uh, install fleet data. Obviously, you have to be a, an Inmarsat in uh, customer in order to, to uh, use our infrastructure to, to transfer the data. But if you're not an interest in Marsat customer yet, you can become one. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm open for questions, two, three minutes. Then we have the panel and uh, for a very interesting and profitable discussion. If not, uh, I'll let you continue. Or I could just ask questions. Oh, aha, that would be OK. You mentioned day, because this is one of the points that I've been uh, digging away at quite a lot over the last couple of years. Because we, every, everybody talks about data, but everybody's got a different meaning for data. Because one man's greens is in another man's greens. Um, so you mentioned, it's the first time I've, you've, I've heard a sort of clear reference to the VDR, taking the data. But you said taking the data before it goes into the VDR. So if nobody knows, VDR is the Voyage Data Recorder. So everything that is officially recorded and happens on the vessel goes in there. It's the black box of a ship, effectively. So uh, perhaps just recap, what data goes into a VDR? Well, you have the ECDIS data. Uh, you have the speed data, you have the position data, you have the uh, ruder angle uh, data, uh, uh, depth sensors. Uh, yeah. I think you have the, all the communication stuff as well. And yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, are not, we are not registering a radar data, yeah. so there is no image uh, by the time being. That's something that we're working to, to develop. So the, 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 the benefit here is you're able to real time put that ashore and then the, uh, the ship operators actually get a better real-time picture of what's going on on board, so there's better um, oversight Absolutely. and, and improvements uh, there. Uh, other, other opportunities that we're working on, think about your insurance company. If, they are will, if you give them visibility on your VDR, if you give them visibility on your ship performance, you give them visibility on human behavior, I think your uh, insurance company will be willing to reduce your insurance charges because they'll have direct access and visibility in order to verify uh, performance and behavior. Okay, so not only ship performance, but uh, other players like uh, like insurance will uh, will have a significant role in the solution. And when it comes to IoT, it's a phrase that I hear a lot of people using, or um, industrial IoT as well, which is really as much what we're talking about here, because we're not talking about connected fridges in the home here, we're talking on a much more kind of industrial scale. What's the potential here in terms of industrial IoT? Because we're talking about the whole world of connected things like connect and connected ships. So what do you see as the sort of ultimate potential that the industry, the maritime or even any of the ocean industries can get from being engaged in sort of cloud-based solutions like IoT? Well, I mean, this is uh, from cradle to grave because uh, uh, ship designers, ship builders are going to be looking at data before they start drawing, before they start with any sketch because you want to beat your, your existing uh, products and services. And in order to do that, you'll be basing your decisions on uh, empirical data. So it's, it, it would be fundamental from the design uh, uh, to, 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 to the end of life of your physical assets, definitely. Good. Does anybody else have any questions? Quick question for Diego. They gave Please. me a microphone. Actually, they gave me two. Do you mind saying who you are as well, please? I'm Hans from Ambisense Limited in the UK. Just a little bit Hans louder. Thank you. From Ambisense Limited in the UK, Scotland. Uh, so, another, just to follow up a bit on this uh, VDR kind of sensor data, 
so you said you are working now currently in Massachusetts to work on, on radar, including radar data also into the system. Are there other forms of uh, advanced sensors that uh, that you also would like to include into the system? Mm -hmm. And which one? That's the first question. The other is uh, in terms of real time or live data, how is it? Is it, I mean, uh, how frequent should a ship upload to the cloud? Uh -huh. Should it be intermittent or should it be all the time? And what do you think about or what's re real time or live in that okay. perspective from shipping? Uh, th th thank you. Two very good questions. Um, as I said, um, data being ingested in the, in the VDR is the simple and basic data that, that you want to have. It's already coming uh, to the bridge, you know, through the wiring and so on. But our infrastructure, as I said, is agnostic and is able to harvest data from almost any type of sensor, okay? So therefore, uh, we have a d decoding uh, capabilities through different in interfaces for serial data, digital data, uh, and so on. Okay. Uh, therefore, other applications are cargo monitoring, for example. Okay. I want to understand what are uh, uh, temperature, humidity of my cargo. This supports it very well, very well, very well. In terms of real time, I mean satellite. Connectivity is not real time. Real time is streaming. You know, is uh, I'm watching live, and we know there is there is a, a delay because of the technology, because of the infrastructure. Uh, therefore, we we say instant or almost real time. It's not streaming service. It's not a streaming service. Nevertheless, you can uh, upload your 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 data. You can you can have a, a connectivity, uh, unlimited number of sensors because we have four different plans. And uh, you can install unlimited number of sensors, and you you can have as many uh, uh, data transfers uh, in a day as as you want. Okay, so there is there is a freemium package where you just pay for the hardware and the installation, and the service is for free, and that that is narrowed down to only eight data tags, and that's to give customers a flavor of the potential of the solution. And then there are a couple of intermediate solutions, and then you have the, the unlimited. And uh, I mean, believe me, the, 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 the price per month, less than $400 per month for unlimited access uh, to your onboard data is, I mean, considering the value of the assets, considering the value uh, of the goods that you're transporting on a ship, uh, we, we, we consider it uh, irrelevant. I'm going to take one more very quick question at the back before we move on to the panel, please. Joshua Flood, Valor Consultancy. Hey, Josh. Lunch. Good presentation, Diego. I had Thank a couple you. questions, actually. It's not so quick. But Which one's so the most important one? Okay, the most important one. Fleet Express has 7,000 vessels almost subscribed to it. You've launched Fleet Data, your IoT solution, in September last year. How many people, or how many vessels have subscribed to Fleet Data thus far? We are slowly launching fleet data through our, um, on our Fleet Express uh, customers and through the retail channel, okay? So through the direct channel. Therefore, we narrow it down very much to the customer base that, that we are addressing, okay? Therefore, the expectation is on the, on the rollout, on the big rollout of, the, of this promotion where we are uh, working on installing the 300 uh, 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 fleet data solutions at the moment. So, so far we, we've run specific trials on different segments, okay? What we are into, and we are working uh, on different um, mm, mm, customer cases, okay, that you would like to, to showcase. Therefore, we are not, you know, going massive on a, on a very wide uh, launch. We want to be very specific, we want to target very very specific customers work on the use cases, and then do the whole rollout throughout our network. Okay, so it was 300, I think. Was it? Say it again, 300? please. You just said then. That that's the promotion. Yeah, yeah. That that that's a promotion. It's on our car, uh, on, on our shoulders. It's uh, it's a free installation. You get free hardware for three months, and you get the free service for three months or six months in case you uh, you sign up for API services. Thank you. Good. 
Thank you very much for your input here. I'm going to ask you to leave, please. I have to leave. Thank you very and much. I'm going to ask, you understand. I'm going to ask one of your colleagues, Alison Gray, and the other panellists to come up onto the stage, please. We've got Eric Lund from Rainmaking. We have got George Pesh from Cargo Tech. And we heard mention of uh, ScanReach. So we've got Jacob Eid from ScanReach um, here. Come join Don't me. you want to? Now, over the, the, recently, in Marsat and Cargo Tech, joined up with Rainmaking on a project. And my basic definition of Rainmaking is you're kind of like a, um, it's like one of those companies that goes headhunting for the right kind of company or the right kind of person. So you went to Rainmaking to help you find the right kind of company here to use this whole IoT in the future here. So Ali, can you just explain a little bit about your role sure. and really what you wanted to find? All right, so I'm, I'm uh, Diego's colleague, but I work in a very different part of Inmarsat. My, I run a team called Product Incubation. And our role, we're quite new, we've been going for about 18 months. Our role is specifically to find the kinds of partners that we would not usually work with as a large corporate and to, to run innovation projects within a sort of walled garden where we're allowed to take bigger risks than we otherwise would uh, in the rest of the business. So, um, so that's a lovely remit. I, have the, I think I have the best job at Imasat. Um, but we do need some help sometimes in finding those innovators globally, even though we're a global organization. And so the likes of Rainmaking have been absolutely brilliant. I would say that they're probably the, the strongest accelerator globally. This is a great piece of PR for you. Thank um, you. Thank you. And, and Are you now? Yeah. <laughs> no, can I have the, free, the next accelerator free? <laughs> Um, but they, they did a really good job. The, the process is that, that we go with a bunch of other corporates. And actually, the, the strength of this is 50% that we're working with other corporates. Um, and, the, and it's the digital teams and innovation teams from those other corporates. So we get to have those conversations that we wouldn't easily have. So, so we're having those conversations. We're looking for opportunities. They've got their own ring fence processes as well. So we can, we can play in a, in a wall garden. And then at the same time, we get to work with innovative companies. Usually, in the case of Rainmaking here, they're innovative companies who are not super early stage. They're people who want to scale. So they're people who can use the likes of Inmarsat and Cargo Tech and Varsilla, who were the partners on this program, to scale their businesses. So we're after that sort of win-win-win opportunity where Inmarsat, or the corporate partner, wins, the startup wins. We know Rainmaking wins in there, but also our customers win as well. All right? So that's, that's, that's our intention, really. And these guys have done a good job for us. Uh, they, they found ScanReach. They sound good. I'll come to ScanReach so, in a minute. Yeah. But I'm just going to go to George now, because from Cargo Tech's perspective, you've got a different business to Inmarsat, totally different business yes. to Inmarsat. You're a product developer, service orientated, now very heavily service orientated now. So what, is, what was your, what I'm curious here is, as a, Inmarsat has got one type of company it must be looking for, I would say a very data rich company. Oh, maybe because you want some a company that's going to have a lot of data going up and down your pipe. But what kind of a company were you looking for? Uh, actually, how to say, we are anticipated mm -hmm. to be a kind of product development company uh, equ equipping basically uh, the vessels with uh, our products. Uh, however, we are on a journey uh, which calls itself digitalization. And digitalization is not only about products or technologies, it is very much about collaboration and discussions. And uh, to be able to speed up, you need to collaborate not only with customers, but as well with companies which are good in fields where we actually do need exercise. And the IoT is such a, a place where we are not exercised enough mm -hmm. to survive alone on the market. Yeah. So this is why you needed collaboration with other businesses in fact, like in Marsat. And furthermore, how to say, we of course do invest in the IoT and digitalization, but it is about speeding up as well, such as uh, you said. So uh, how to say, uh, the rainmaking gave us a really accelerator uh, uh, and how to say opportunities to uh, improve our products and, and services in a very short time. And Eric, from Rainmaking's perspective, you're a fairly new, but I would say increasingly influential player in this market. Five years ago, you were not in the maritime sector. I'd never heard of you. All of a sudden, everybody's talking about rainmaking. You know, you've got in there, you've done a number of different projects with different outfits. I know three or four different uh, similar things that you're doing here within the maritime and transport sectors. Are you surprised to find this collaboration 
Are you surprised to find that Vartzilla and Cargo Tech and Inmosat, three companies that I would have found difficult to sit on a panel, well, Vartil is not here, but to sit <laughs> on a panel and say, hey, look, guys, we're working together. I, I, I definitely say that, that uh, you're right. You know, the, uh, the maritime industry is known for progressing with glacial speed, uh, speed mm. more or less. Um, but, but we've definitely seen with the number of challenges the industry is facing with, you know, if, on the ship owners uh, or port operators, you know, profitability and so on and so forth. We have a massive amount of, of issues that need to be challenged and uh, very much seeing with, with industrial partners that, that we've had here that they've been uh, super, super open um, and being very aware that they cannot solve these things by themselves and, and reaching out um, you know, not only trying to find a, a startup or, or a, mm. a external company to collaborate with to find a solution, but also between the partners really seeking, you know, if we put our minds to it together as industrial partners in, in some shape or form or structured process, uh, then we can do more together than we can do individually, right? Uh, and I, I, I do think, obviously, the people that we have represented in the program, the companies that we have represented in the program, are the industrials uh, delivering solution service into the industry as such. But we are very much also seeing on the other side, uh, port operators, uh, shipping line or ship operators, also coming into this because this is ultimately a, a team effort uh, that we're going to, uh, to have to, 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 to do to achieve the challenges that we're facing within the industry. Do you find, Alison, that uh, you've come, you come across occasionally a sort of iPhone moment where you go, I didn't realise that was going to be so good. I didn't realise that product was going to be so needed. You know, nobody knew they wanted an iPhone until they'd got an iPhone. Have you come across those sort of moments where you just thought, this is quite a cool... That's a really good question. What I would say is that actually the, the concept iPhone opportunities in maritime, we come across a lot. Where you, where you think, wow, you know, that really could make a huge impact. The real challenge is getting it into ship operators. And I think the time is now. So I think for a long time and at conferences like this, we've been talking about this digitization, you know, for five years. And I think that in, in many cases, it's been the suppliers that have been talking that talk rather than the ship operators. Um, and, and of course, Inmarsat is a supplier. We're all suppliers in, the, in these industries. But I think the time is now where some of those, those iPhone opportunities that have been sitting on the shelf actually can be used. And you asked a question earlier about data and the importance of data. One of the things, one of the, the things that needs to happen in order for data to be a commercial activity is that the ship operators need to be able to use it. So, so Do they know how to use it. Yeah. Sorry? Do they know how to use it? They, they, I don't want to patronize ship operators, but I think it's, it's, <laughs> it's, um, it, it's a big investment mm. to, to, to move into this digital space. My impression uh, of some ship owners used to be that um, they knew that this data was going to be like uh, gold dust, but they didn't quite know what to do with it. So they're going to sit on it, yeah. not let anybody else see it, yeah. and just wait and see what they could actually make a value out of it. I think that's a, f that's a fair assumption. And I, I think the, the way to get gold is actually not to look at all of the data and start, start saving all of the data. Inmarsat can do that for you. Mm. What's the, where the gold is, is to say that maybe I just want to look at the fuel flow meter and I want to see it real time and I want to see it in my head office for 50 of my ships so that I can compare the efficiency of these ships. So I think that the, the, the gold is in the detail. So that's what we, in, and in doing trials like the one that we're doing, mm. that's what we're looking for the gold. Does that no. make sense? I'm gonna to come to you in a second, Jacob. Yeah. But one of the things we, we keep on referencing in terms of data is sensors and sensors around on the vessel. So the quality of the data has got to be there. Is the sensor quality building up and therefore the data getting better or are we just getting more data? Uh, I guess it's uh, both of it. So data quality will be one of the main topics in the future, mm. I guess. Up to now, it is getting excess of data and how to say storing in a proper place, not only the VDR, but the ship's database as well and the cloud solutions later on. But uh, how to say, it will be more and more business decisions being done on basis of this data and therefore the data quality issue will rise. So uh, we from McGregor actually deliver VDRs to our customers and we actually see hmm. that there is some issues with the data quality on board of ships. 
So does the data quality infer a, a problem then in making the decisions about what to do with the data? Because you can get data, but you've got to an analyze the data, and you can say, oh, look, there's something wrong here. But then you've got to think of the solution that will actually improve the operation capacity on a ship so that you get different data back, which in turn says, yes, it's got better, or no, it's not. Let's go back and look at that. So I'm thinking about data impact loop there. Um, how, how, to say, how to say, we at McGregor do not have a global approach to this, but uh, when it comes to McGregor equipment, where we actually, how to say, collect the data and, and uh, gain the sensor data, we are actually act actively working on, uh, uh, how to say, data checks and uh, improvement of data quality and assessment of data. So one data will not only come as a data, but as a data, including the assessment, is this going to be trustable in whatever ways? Yep. ScanReach, you've got a product that can see through walls, effectively. You've designed this system that can steer, that can actually take a, a signal through steel walls. Um, great, from my perspective, as an ex-seafarer for seafarer safety, down in the bottom of large vessels, when you're in the engine room, etc. Um, and, and, um, and also increasingly sort of been able to get the data without having to re-cable the whole, whole ship. So you three effectively found this company through your, the rain-making program. You came up with, the, found this company. I went to Bergen and saw this company a couple of months ago, and I saw their, and it, I, mu I must say, it doesn't look much. <laughs> and I think that's the benefit about it, isn't it? It's a very unintrusive product that you've got. So let's just hear what it is first. We, yeah, um, for the last four or five years, we have um, been, say, under the radar, going to you know, approach the, um, the um, how do we transport data through steel. Um, so we used um, incredible lot of time just addressing that problem, also in full scale. Um, so the breakthrough, about two, and two years ago, we had a breakthrough. Um, so, so we manage, uh, so we managed to um, to control the technology. So we ended up with, uh, say, two solutions. We have a mesh node. It's about, this is very, very small. If you look at your Wi-Fi router back home, that will be that. This one is probably one fourth of that. Um, so it's this very, very small mesh node, very cheap. Uh, it's a plug-and-play installation. You don't need any servants, technicians, and everything to do it. And we also developed a a tag for humans, so in order to, to actually track people in steel environments. So then we have actually two, solu two solutions. We have what we call InConnect, where you can connect all your equipment uh, wirelessly or cable. You can actually cable straight into the mesh node if you want. Um, so, and then you also have the, uh, the, uh, to track people. We also yesterday signed a contract for tracking um, assets and also trying to track cargo inside. So it's inside wireless inside uh, connectivity that we launched. And yesterday we launched this with 50 of our partners and friends that have been following us for, for many years. Um, we think and hope that is the moment. Yesterday was the moment where wireless connectivity hit the maritime industry. And it, we believe that's probably one of the most important technologies um, to be launched probably for this decade. It will really change how you harvest data, the price of harvest data, also the players, how we so fast could work with Imasat to make an end-to-end -end solution on board Nazi Giant. We did that in six weeks. We are running an end-to-end -end solution. From so you put on the, on the, on the, on the Giant, uh, you yeah. put these mesh, mesh modes, mesh nodes, in various places around the engine room, so you've got a complete yeah. signal network. About two to three hours. It's, yeah. it's a huge vessel, 160 meter long, 30 meter wide, 10 decks, 120 people, um, a lot of machinery. It's a huge, complicated vessel. It's only take a couple of hours to do the inst and they, and had And they can then pick up not just the, the yeah. signal from the cruise. At the pack. moment, we pick up flow, we pick up 
weather data from the wheelhouse, local weather data, which is also important. We're testing with Vesla for their uh, any RAM sensors, which will go in 22nd of June into the vessel wirelessly for, uh, for, for connecting that as well. We have all kind of environment, environmental data. Um, so, so you're talking about quite a big part of the ecosystem here. Um, so I think what's going to happen, I think this is the tool, this is the moment that the maritime industry has been looking for because they have to have a very, very low cost solution. Plug and play, you can easily install it as the ship is in operation, you don't have to go to shore. Um, so it's, it's a lot of disruptive, in there. there's no CapEx, there's only an OPEX in this, it's just a license. Um, so, it's, uh, so, it, so, so this is a true game changer. It's been tested, yeah. yeah. So the, the, the data comes off of the machinery, from the crew, from the various sensors, into the mesh node. It goes up into a, some sort of central system. Yeah, so we, and then, we're, we're in, in Masat. We go yeah, straight into, into the in Masat system. Yeah, into, into fleet data. Straight so. into yeah. the fleet data box in the end node. Yeah. And then, then... Up into the cloud. Yeah, but it works. Important here also because you inc the safety level for, 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 for the vessel is increased for not knowing where your crew are to knowing where your crew are. So it actually has to work during a black ship. If you get a blackout, it even works for three days because it's also charged a, a, a battery inside. Mm. Uh, but the data goes straight into the fleet data. The, the, the technology, the good thing here, the technology is very compl complementary. So it just fits. Uh, and uh, and um, then we can start working on the end solution, the value for the clients, straight away, like Nazi Giant and others. Uh, so the speed of innovation here is tremendous. You're talking about mm. months or weeks, not years. And that's also how it would change shipping, how the maritime industry have to change to collaborate, because this, somebody will do this, and they will do it tomorrow. And if that's your competitor, they will outperform you because it doesn't cost anything. It's a mindset, it's yeah. a way of working. So if the ship owners still are sitting or the maritime industry still think they could sit and look at digitization for the next five years. But this goes back to my question a minute ago about the ship operator, ship owner, just thinking, I don't know what to do with this gold dust. I'm just gonna put it into a cushion and sit in it. How do you, or you, maybe not rainmaking directly, but how do you convince the ship operator, the ship owner, that that gold dust can be used? How do, what's the message that you can take to the industry to say, look, start valuing your data? Basically, it is contradictious to the iPhone you just mm. uh, mentioned. Because, how to say, uh, the hype cycle is very much over, and right now we actually deliver solutions to our customer problems, which basically means that uh, you don't need any attraction around that because you are solving uh, actually an issue. And uh, how to say, uh, this is of course quite a journey, this is about co collaboration, because uh, how to say, the real output for the customer, the savings, uh, the revenue streams, uh, many of those are unknown for now. But this will improve, and this is going to be a step-by-step -step and, as you said, mm. very agile solution where you need to set up, where you test, you might fail, skip it, but many of your efforts will survive mm. and evolve some, some later on. To be able to find a scan reach, when you do these, this project, sort of like to hunt out a good solution to what in Marsat and Cargotech and Vatsa are looking at, when you go looking for a company like, and you find something like ScanReach, how many companies do you actually need to look at before you find a scan reach? When you started, when Inmarsat and Cargotech and Vatsala went to rainmaking, what did rainmaking do? Did you, did you scratch your head and go, oh my God, where do I start with this one? Well, and then I met this guy who said, I can get to put a radio wave through steel and that's <laughs> it, right? <laughs> no, it, 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 it's, you know, Ali mentions that saying that we're an accelerator, mm. but as, as such, we're not really an accelerator in, 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 in that case, because what you see in typical accelerators is that they work with, um, you know, two guys in a, a PowerPoint or something like that, and the whole idea of that is actually to mature uh, the company to, uh, to make it grow, and then for the corporate partners, maybe there'll be something uh, out of it, but it's not really as sure a bet as it could be. Uh, and and what, what we're working with is was more a, a, what you call a corporate startup engagement model, where we spent quite a lot of time initially to 
identify what are the topical areas that a, an Inmarsat, a, a cargo tech group, uh, and uh, Vatsla are looking forward to, to solve. So in the case of the program that Scanreach uh, joined us with, uh, we actually worked with uh, five topical areas uh, within uh, you know, the area of safety, within the area of operational efficiency, whether it's on board the vessel or on terminal and stuff like that. Uh, and based on that, then we go global uh, and uh, through our networks, through our you know, competences, uh, both you know, automated but also you know, feet on the ground, uh, search where do we find relevant mm. companies that have something that are similar to what we're looking for. So in case of this project, uh, this program, we were out touching give and take 700 uh, companies. 700 companies? From, uh, from 55 countries. So there, there, were, there were 700 startup type yeah. companies with data related, onboard data related. Related, related to solutions. the topics that we were looking okay. for, yeah. And we, we took that through a uh, qualification process uh, where we ended up uh, presenting uh, our best uh, estimate of 50 companies that we thought would be relevant for, uh, for our partners. And from that, we ended up um, uh, together selecting 15 companies uh, that were then invited into the program. And, and, and what we then do is basically a you know, super, super short, super, super focused process where uh, these guys got together with the, the startups and, and the, the corporate partners spent the first day and saying, why are we doing this? What are our challenges? What are we looking for? Uh, Cargo Tech came up and said, there's a $150 billion opportunity in uh, logistics organization. We need to figure out how to do that. Uh, Vatsla came and said, there's a $2 billion uh, per year in, in uh, accident-related uh, incidents. We need to do something with that. Uh, and, you know, we're saying we need to find ways to actually operate and valorize the data uh, from the vessels. We need to do something about that. There's a monetary uh, value to that we need to address. Uh, and thereafter, then uh, the, uh, the, the, the startups, you know, present themselves. There's, uh, you know, wedding planner matchmaking aspect of it. Uh, but, but as, you know, as, as a consequence of it, obviously the, the, the startup companies are, you know, that's their lifeblood, they're out pitching all day, and that, but uh, our corporate partners were likewise super, super prepared for what they were looking for, right? So it meant from the initial selection stage, we ended up with 11 of the 15 startup companies that went into the program had projects identified together with the partners in, in total, we ended up after the first on-site session with uh, 18 different business projects across the, uh, the corporate partners. Um, and, and then we mentioned the six or seven weeks period where basically, you know, okay, now you validate. You need to figure out, does this project fly? You know, can we make, does it make sense? Do we have the resource and so on and so forth? That when we finalized uh, the program uh, a month ago, three weeks ago, um, a total of 12 projects were presented uh, between the, uh, the three corporate partners with eight of the 11 startup companies. And now we're talking, you know, here, which is then one month later, mm. Scanreach is launching together with uh, Inmarsat, together with Vatsla. Uh, we have Arundo uh, is launching together with you. You know, they have the demo running on the McGregor stand and uh, in in six minutes and 53 seconds. <laughs> then we'll hear about Logino. Uh, likewise, uh, through the program, identified a partnership with, uh, with Navis. So, so that means that this is not for our pleasure. We want to do something. We want to, to, to move the lever. We want to create impact. And that's really what our corporate partners uh, managed to do with the startups. And I say, since we're now in Norway, it's actually bloody cool that out of the 700 startups we were looking for in 55 countries. Uh, two of them were Norwegian, Scanreach and Arundo, and both of them are here at North Shipping <laughs> with product launches uh, through the program that were not conceived. I know that your senses were conceived several years ago, but the projects, the engagements were not conceived before the 23rd of March. 
two months ago, or three months and ago. Let me just ask then, you two, from Inmarsat's perspective and from Cargo Tech's perspective, when you found these companies that um, Rainmaking had a, a hit, a sort of found for you, gone out and, and found for you, what do you want to do with them? Do you want to partner with them, acquire them? Do you want to... Um, I mean, what's the um, from a corporate level? I mean, I would yeah. I would say a company like Scanreach, if if this product is going to work, surely you're just going to go or Cargotech and go. Actually, yeah, this I'm going to we're going to buy this one. Let's bring it in house. Not sure if you're for sale. I'm not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you understand my point that you've yeah. got these startups. They need money. They uh, they need to ramp up. Yeah. You know, they are. Pr How long did you say you spent doing your R and D? Five, six, seven years. Uh, Fifty million. Yeah? Yeah, five, six years. Yeah, so at some point you must have thought we could do with another injection of cash here. <laughs> yeah, but that was... Again, I'm not yeah, saying you was, did, but my yeah, point no. is with all these yeah. other companies, some of them might go, you know what, we need an injection of cash. We need so all, all options open is the yeah. answer to that. Um, and rather than jumping, though, and saying, right, we're going to buy these guys now, because actually corporates buying smaller organizations is not necessarily the best thing for a smaller organization. <laughs> First of all, within this ring-fenced... It's this sort of walled play, playground that we've got. Actually, the, the, the thing to do within that time frame is to find what the right model is. Um, and then you decide. I mean, I'm, I know I'm stating the obvious here, but you <laughs> find out what the right model is for collaboration and then put the contracts in place. One of the nice things is that actually all of this is done on trust. So we have, we have an NDA, and that's yeah. it. We've installed Inmarsat equipment on a ship. We did it in a faster time than ever before because we didn't sign any contracts. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so we so actually we we will play, and then it may be that investment is a, is a good idea, but only as a means mm. to an end. Actually, the the value that Imosat brings to organisations like Scanreach is distribution channel. So we have all of the maritime players in the market. So that's you know how we're giving that. What's the best thing to to give back? You've answered my question to him. Yeah. yeah, so oh, what's sorry. the benefit for you? <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. So all options open. Yeah. Yeah, so, so basically uh, same, same for McGregor. Yeah. So all of those collaboration models were during this rainmaking process really openly communicated. I was really surprised about that. So it was part of the assessment and it was uh, very open discussions. And uh, so yeah, basically uh, same as you. So uh, we are providing distribution channels uh, for those companies, and uh, I'll say of course there's different kinds of willingness for the one or other collaboration model, and this needs to be investigated case by case. Of and do, do you find, from a cargo tech perspective here, when you're when you're looking at this industry, you? It, Traditionally, Cargo Tech McGregor was a very um, engineering-based company. You yeah. had very um, shipboard solutions. Mm. You know, McGregor, you know, deck hatches. You had cranes. You had very sort of very sort of mechanical, heavy, industrialized, marinized products yeah. that go onto the ship. I can only imagine it must have been one hell of a shift to suddenly go from that sort of mechanical. Um, ocean industry technology to be digitally focused as well. How do you, and it, it might be a bit of an, an odd question, but how do you marry that heavy industry with that digital uh, competence? Um, I would say the major issue or to be solved is basically not the kind of products. We can very well live with a software package being brought to our customers besides, uh, how to say, heavily sized equipment. But uh, what we actually do need to, e to exercise, and which uh, the rainmaking provided a very good uh, sandbox uh, as well, is to marry agile processes with the waterfall processes being established in a company like Cargo Tech or McGregor. And from Inmarsat's perspective, as a satellite uh, communication service provider, yeah, you've been in operation, what is it, for 40? 40 years this 40 year. Years. Yeah. Um, so satellite connectivity really is fairly young, but it's certainly, in the, I'm comparing it to the shipping industry. Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. I think broadband access is pretty young. Mm. It's very young. You know, um, uh, the kind of access that we enjoy on land is very, very young and is, has, mm. has only been adopted at um, a captain and little bit of crew level. It hasn't been adopted at a ship level yet. Yeah. So yes, I think you're right. So the, the, the opportunity there for Inmarsat in terms of the, the... I saw this report that you did a couple of weeks ago about um, 
crew welfare, it was related to crew welfare and internet yeah. access for crews. And it was, yeah. it was, I was impressed by the amount of, how much it increased yes, over it's the years. Yes, it's a really big growth area. Yeah, so uh, there is that, that knock-on benefit for there. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's good to see, see that happening. Just before we close, we've got a, just a couple of minutes. I just want to go back to, tell me about that very first idea. Who was it who looked at a bit of steel and went, I think I can put a signal through that? The idea of Scanrish, and, and when Scanrish is quite, I think it's a, quite a different startup in the way that uh, it's quite a senior startup. We're coming from the Martin offshore industry and fused that with the Norwegian very forward leading, leading microsensor environment because Norway have a very strong environment for sensor technology for wireless. So we actually come, uh, we're coming from the safety side. So we wanted to make, you know, the safety at the Seven Seas is not very good because you don't know where people are when things happen. So we wanted to solve that. And in order to solve that, we needed to have connectivity. Because you, cannot, you, go, you can't run around with a cable, can you? So, so, uh, so we, and that was actually, we needed to solve that to save lives. So our mission, and that's why we got the best, probably the best people, to addressing the problem, quitting. I had uh, 60 employees in my work and sold my company. I went all in. People were working three years without any salaries, uh, addressing a high mission, saving lives. And then we fused with the Royal Norwegian Navy for two years. They opened up everything that we can test with them. People, boats, the most heavy land-based test facilities probably in North Europe. Uh, uh, so we can test for thousands and thousands and thousands of hours. Um, so, so it's, uh, uh, and then we needed to go through steel. So it's an iterative process, uh, combining three different technologies. But we can't, we can do that later. Uh, and we, that was a, this Kodak moment, Kodak and that's happened. Yeah. Uh, and that will change the shipping industry. But you wouldn't have been able to, what you've achieved, what you're going to achieve, hopefully going to achieve, you wouldn't be able to really, how much of this would you be able to achieve if we didn't have satellite broadband? Yeah, bringing the data to land, you're talking about. Uh, yeah, I realise that you can put a system where you can monitor crews from the bridge and see where everybody yeah, yeah, is, yeah, yeah, so you've got an yeah. emergency station there. You don't need uh, satellite connectivity for that. But what I'm saying is, in terms of the operational benefits that you're also talking about, that real economic value that uh, uh, ship operates. It's fundamental. The, the, yeah. What we do with Imasat yeah. is completely fundamental. And the yeah. way they deal with it, with a with with secure IoT line full in you know, unlimited capacity yeah. sensor, because the number of sensors will just dramatic increase now, because this, the third party sensors bringing into wireless network will disrupt the old type of sensors. Uh, so that's what's happening. Two, two, three things happening at the same time here. Mm -hmm. You have this uh, disruption of the costs and the way you bring the data to land. You have disruption of the way we drive the connectivity with wireless. And then you even have a disruption on the, 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 the type of sensors. And then you have edge computing. And this is, uh, this is probably a nightmare for an old-fashioned ship owner or something. You know, this is something hitting them. <laughs> and you can say, uh, oh my god, this is, I can't deal with this. But it will kill them over time. This is, this is the, I think, no shipping, this, this no shipping, you have to look back and say, in 10 years, I said, this is, this is, the, you know, this is the day we also changed the way we're working, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Suddenly, we had to work differently yeah. because there's we so much technology. And remember, the startups, the startups today are probably startups by people who have been working in the industry for 10, 20 years, and they suddenly say, this, they all see this. So if the yeah. ship owner doesn't see it, it will hit them like a hammer. I guess that's the bit that some people miss, is the fact that a lot of people that are coming in with the startups, have you found this, Eric, the companies that, come, that you're finding, the startups that you're putting to the companies like this, these are the ones started by people who have been in the industry and identified a spot. They are not necessarily come from external. Or do you see a lot of external startups and say, actually, that product would be great in the maritime sector? I, I think you're right in saying that we are seeing a lot of industry people uh, going out trying to address issues and creating companies. Uh, and, and, and then I think a part of our model, just to give you an example, is if we don't find 
companies that are specific to the industry. Then we go, so what are the adjacent industries where there might be solutions saying, hey guys, have you thought about what you do here? Could actually be applying here, right? And, and whether we sort of nudge them or they themselves say, hey, we have an opportunity there. But I think the, the, uh, the watershed moment is that the, the, the shipping industry, the maritime industry, has been very reluctant to, uh, to innovate, really, to take great steps and to collaborate. And, and that's what we're seeing now, that there's a much greater willingness to collaborate between industrial partners, but also between uh, you know, a variety of, of, of operators. And that's what's going to be able to move things uh, forward. And you know, it is so commoditized by now, uh, the margins are so low. So if you do want to s survive and uh, be profitable, it, now it's time to, to move on. The uh, traditional business models don't fly anymore. Good. Thank you very much to our panel, to Alice and George, Eric and Jacob, and of course, to you, Diego, further on. That comes to the end of the panel. If you do have a question, I've got a questioning corner over there for you if you want. You. If you have some questions for the panel, please take them over there and grab them for a second to have a chat with them. Thank you. Can we say thank you to our panel? Thank you.